Sounds True presents River of Stars, the soul journey of Gaelic soprano and Ireland's living treasure, Nuri Nurian. From a village in County Cork, Ireland, the angelic voice of Noreen Noreen has risen and touched the ears of the world. Best known for her recordings with the Benedictine monks of Glenstall Abbey in Limerick, Noreen Noreen is also a teacher of women's creativity and a scholar of traditional religious Irish song. Now on River of Stars, Noreen Noreen speaks about the path of her life as she introduces us to some of the shining women artists, saints, and spirits who have shaped her life, her work, and her love for the divine. And now, River of Stars with Nuri Nurian. My name is Noreen Ni Rian. And before I invite you to join me on a journey, I want to tell you what my name means. It's an Irish name and in English it would translate to Noreen Ryan. Noreen is a diminutive form of Nora and the full word of Nora would be Hanora, Honora, which is from the Latin meaning honour, meaning integrity. So my mother was called Nora, my grandmother was called Nora, and I'm little Nora in that line. Ni is as in French, ne, which is daughter of, ni, n-i. Rian means a star path. So now, friends, I invite you to join me on this thrust, as we call it in Irish, which also is so closely aligned to the word thrust or trust. And to trust me on that pathway to introduce you on the way. We'll make a visit here and there to various people, I think mainly women, who have influenced my life and have enhanced my life and my journey on that star path. Following in the line of one of our most marvellous poets from the Irish tradition, who's dead, Ganina Dia Trokra Era Anam, Sean O'Riordan, he once said, Raimid Amu Tamil Ele is Kihimid Antir. Let us go astray a little bit longer on this journey and we'll see the country. So I invite you to trust me and to see. So here we go, astray. My first conscious awareness of women's creativity dates consciously back to the age of 18. And let me take you back there and try and paint the picture of one particular day in my education I was in a little room which had a piano, a little piano room in a boarding school in Northern Ireland or very near Northern Ireland in a place called Dundalk. And I was doing my final examination before I went to university. And there I had intended doing a degree in law in University College Dublin. I was the only student doing music in that boarding school. And to examine me, a man came from the department, a man who had a doe-like face, a gnarled face, very much ridden and pained by arthritis. A man in his 60s at that time called Pilla whom I had never met before. And so he came in the door and he had beady, piercing eyes, wonderful eyes, quite cruel eyes too, and looked at me and said, what are you doing? I was petrified, terrified, nervousness. I said, I'm going to do law in University College Dublin. He said, no, you're not. So he said, you're going to do music in my university in Cork. And so that started another journey of my life. 
I said, but what about my parents? And he said, never mind your parents. I'll deal with them. And so he did. He went, came down and on his way home between Dundalk and Cork, he called into my parents. So that day, that pill of all era drove into my parents and said, you must trust me. She'll be in my choir. I'll look after her. I'll give her all my books. I'll teach her. And that he did. Not only that, but the legacy which Pilbo Lera gave me was some 200 what we call Shan Nos, which is old style songs from a wonderful tradition of County Waterford, which is South East Ireland. And when I did go to learn music in University College in Cork, Pilib, every Saturday, I would go and I would sit quite literally at his feet with no tape recorder, but just person to person learning these 200 songs. It was an ecstatic and the opposite experience sometimes too, but it's been part of what I am. And so Pilib Olera, who died in 1976, just at that time I had married at the age of 21 and with my husband opted out to live on love and the Irish language and went to an Irish speaking area in County Waterford, coming back with these songs, with these songs which had died out in Pillib's lifetime and going down to the pub at night and starting off to sing one of these songs. The pub would suddenly go into silence. The memory was coming back. I was bringing back this memory which had died. And so it was such an experience to have the older singers come over and say, ah, but you've a wrong note there. Or that wasn't the word we would use. So I felt very much a carrier of a tradition a feeling which I still would have now of being a secondary source where music, songs are coming back through me, through my identification. Out of that repertoire of 200 or more songs, there was one which moved me always so deeply. On the one hand, I found it so easy to learn and I used to keep asking my guru, Philip at the time, I remember saying to him, why, why do I find it so easy to sing this song? And he thought this was a ridiculous question. He didn't really want to enter into this at all. And he would, no, let's go on to the next song. You have that one now, he would say. But I would go home and I found this song coming right back in my dreams, in my whole existence. And it wasn't until much, much later when I started to do a postgraduate on traditional religious song in Irish that I found the reason why. The knot opened, the flower blossomed, because it was written, I believe, by a woman. And so this is women's music. I'd love to sing a little blast of that song, that particular song that meant so much to me then and still means it to me now. It's a song from County Kerry, which was usually sung after the rosary. These 50 Hail Marys all sung in close succession. And... This was sung after the rosary by in tradition. The version that I have was sung by a woman called Banny Honel, Mrs O'Sullivan, who lived in Cahar Daniel, which is the Evrog Peninsula of County Kerry. And it's a lullaby for Jesus that Mary is singing, where she's looking at him. Peter, Apostle, have you seen my love so bright? Mahonox Mahono. Yes, I saw him midst his enemies. A harrowing sight. Mahonox Mahono. And then she goes through the sorrows. Is that the child that I bore nine months in my womb? That was born in a stable when no house would give us room. And then she keeps coming back to Alleluia, O Isa. Go to sleep, Jesus, my little thing. Alleluia, O Isa. O Jesus, my little thing. So it's a mixture there of a lullaby and a lament. Sean O'Casey once said that our songs, our life, life is a lament in one ear and a song in the other.
I'm sure what I was reacting to there in my total identification with that song, that song is a second skin to me, was a feeling, and it's with me now, of when I was young, about the age of seven or eight. Every day I used to steal into my parents' bedroom and in that bedroom in rural Ireland and County Limerick there was a tiled fireplace and on the fireplace was a crucifix, a silver and black crucifix. And I used to say mass there every day on that crucifix to a congregation of hundreds of people. And I used to give out an imaginary Holy Communion, which was a little white sweet that was very popular then called a silver mint. And I would give this out to imaginary people. And this was part of my daily ritual. It wasn't until I was about nine or ten that I realised I could never be a priest. I couldn't even be an altar girl in my tradition. Then every evening my mother used to keep hens out the back. It's a very important part of the daily routine was feeding these hens. But every evening I went out to make sure they said their night prayers. And they used to reply back to me. Bleak, 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 bleak. And I was convinced that they were saying the Our Father. So we used to say Vespers every evening. And from there I feel my connection with animals and the whole spiritual side of animals. Thomas Merton, I think it was, who said that every four-legged creature is a saint. At the age of seven, my parents, who, as I said, weren't particularly musical, but recognised that I was always singing, singing in the car, singing at home. It was the only social activity I carried on. I didn't have friends. I had a little dog, a little Cocker Spaniel dog, to whom I sang to, and it was my best friend. But at the age of seven, they took me into the nearby city of Limerick to learn singing. And there I came under the influence of a very powerful, strong-willed, she captivated me, woman. And so between seven and twelve, I learned, um, I had a very sweet voice then. My repertoire was somewhere over the rainbow, way up high. Very much that style of song, popular songs. And she really thought of me as her little Julie Andrews. And so I did lots of competitions and sang. It was a happy time in my life. At the age of 12, I went to boarding school, some 300 miles away from home. And of course, at this time, in the early 60s, we didn't get home for three months at a time. So I missed home, missed home a tremendous amount. And again, it was my singing, which was a great joy and which was a release of loneliness. At night times, I would very often steal into the church, the back of the church, that chapel, as it was called. And I'd doodle away singing Gregorian chant. That was the first time I came in contact with Gregorian chant, which is, of course, a chant from the Roman Catholic tradition, age old chant. That was also my first encounter with the goddess come Saint Bridget. Because Dundalk, where I went to school, was just three miles from one of the many, many places that are credited with her birth. And so every February the 1st, which is her feast day at home, which was also the pagan feast of Imbolc, um, because Bridget was a goddess before Christianization, And then Christian image of Bridget made her saint. Bridget was goddess of fertility, of poetry, of smithscraft, of womanhood. She's patroness of poetry and learning, of healing, of healing of fertility and of craftsmanship. Her influence is not confined to Ireland alone. Indeed, legend has it that the medieval knights of chivalry chose Bridget as their patroness. And it was they who first called their wives brides. Bridget's familiar title, familiar name, pet name at home is Muire, Muire Noel, which is Mary of the Irish and her life, her vitality, her closeness to Christ has lived and survived through her own words from the 4th, 5th century, which is her prayer in the Old Irish. There are many, many translations of St Bridget's prayer from Old Irish into English. 
but the one that speaks to me loudest is one done by the marvellous poet Brendan Keneally. St Bridget's Prayer I'd like to give a lake of beer to God. I'd love the heavenly hosts to be tippling there for all eternity. I'd love the men of heaven to live with me, to dance and sing. If they wanted, I'd put at their disposal vats of suffering. White cups of love I'd offer to every man. Sweet pictures of mercy I'd offer with a heart and a half. I'd make heaven a cheerful spot because the happy heart is true. The happy heart is true. I'd make the men contented for their own sake. And I'd like Jesus to love me too. I'd gather the people of heaven from all the parishes around. I'd give a special welcome to the women, the three Marys of great renown. I'd sit with the men, the women of God, there by the lake of beer. We'd be drinking good health forever. And every drop, every drop would be a prayer. Bridget's blessing for you. May the cross of Bridget protect you. May the blessing of the light of Bridget be on you, light within and light without. May the fire of Bridget shine on you and warm your hearts until they glow like great fires so that friends and strangers may come and warm themselves at it. And may the light shine out of the two eyes of you like candles lit in the windows of a house bidding the wanderer come in out of the storm. May the blessing of the light of God and Bridget light up your way.
Bridget was always to me a sensual type of figure. Moira Noel, Mary of the Irish, sometimes bringing up the Virgin Mary, but more often than not bringing up another saint, Mary Magdalene. Saint come sinner. And so Mary Magdalene captivated me with that mixture of light and darkness, sensuality, piety, femininity, creativity. Moira Magdalena, as we would call her in Irish. She comes through in the words of Padraig Pierce, founder of our state and founder of what we are, who addresses Mary Magdalene. O woman of the gleaming hair, wild hair that won men's gaze to thee, weary thou turnest from the common stair, for the shuler Christ is calling thee. O woman of the snowy side, many a lover has lain with you, yet left you sad at the morning tide. But thy lover Christ will comfort thee. O woman with the wild thing's heart, old sin had set a snare for thee. In the forest ways forspent thou art, but the hunter Christ shall pity thee. O woman, spend thrift of thyself, spend thrift of all the love within thee, sold unto sin for little pelf, but the Captain Christ shall ransom thee. O woman, that no lover's kiss, though many a kiss was given thee, could slake thy love. Is it not for this, is it not for this, that the hero Christ shall die for thee? This is a song to Mary Magdalene that I've never sung for anybody before outside of myself. That I've had in a notebook waiting to be birthed. And now is the time. Oh, the bright sun is gone and the clouds overhang as winding up the angry hill there comes the son of man bow down beneath the cruel cross a cross he bears for me i wipe the face and feel the loss on lone calvary on cruel calvary and I, unworthy, wipe the face and feel the pain of our disgrace on cruel Calvary. Many times did I lie by the rich merchant's side. And never in this life was I a proud and virtuous bride. But as I wash the manly face, he smiles and tenderly forgives the pain of our disgrace on lone Calvary, on cruel Calvary. He stumbles to the hanging place Oh, Christ, the shame of our disgrace on cruel Calvary. Pierce the head with your thorns, tear the flesh with your knives, nail the body to the cross, dismember him alive. In vain you make secure the place, in vain you harm the free. Again we'll lift the master's face on lone Calvary, on cruel Calvary. Your mighty empire will lie waste, for men cannot forget the face on cruel Calvary. Cruel 
the presence of Bridget, goddess and saint, and Mary Magdalene, always reappear because of feast days and because there are days in my tradition of the Roman Catholic Church where we stand back and honour them. On Mary Magdalene, it's right the centre of summer, the centre of joy, the centre of open airness, being out in the country, being free. And that's on July the 22nd. For St. Bridget, it's February the 1st. And those three days of February 1st, 2nd and 3rd, friends, are so special to me. February the 1st being the Feast of St. Bridget. February the 2nd being Candlemas, the Feast of Candles, the Feast of Light. And also a feast, of course, a very important feast of Mary, of Our Lady in the Roman Catholic tradition. And the 3rd of February, which I suppose is the most important day of all, is the feast of what we call at home the Feast of St. Blaise, who was the patron saint of the voice. And each year we go and have our throats blessed. And so for me as a singer and somebody who lives with my voice and by my voice and through my voice, the Feast of St. Blaise has always been a very important time. So those three days in February are very, very special. There's a legend from my tradition. It's a dialogue between Bridget and Mary where Mary and Jesus are on their way to Jerusalem and soldiers come and stand out in front of them and Mary calls on Bridget. She said, come on Bridget, you're my friend, will you help me? And Bridget said, no, bother. And so she dons on her head a candelabra of lighted candles and the soldiers are mesmerised and of course Christ and Mary slip through and Mary looks back to Bridget and she said, thanks, Bridget. From now on, your feast day will always be before mine, which is the reason why we have in tradition that the 1st of February is St. Bridget's feast day. The 2nd is the feast day of Our Lady. As I ponder on the roles of Bridget, goddess, Christian saint, Mary Magdalene, as beacons of light on my star path, I can see clearly now that they are connected with a spiritual path rather than something that speaks to my voice directly. Bridget and Mary are almost part of me, almost guardian angels on that side. They were with me before and they'll be with me after. The song tradition, the secular song tradition seems to be there as a stepping stone towards a destination. At where Bridget and Mary will reside and will open the doors. We have a proverb at home in the Irish tradition, which means my story, everybody's story. So to go back to my particular story in song, I want to introduce you to two women singers, not at all as well known, of course, as Mary Magdalene or St. Bridget, and two women who speak very much out of a pre-Christian pagan feeling, much more connected to the whole tradition, wonderful tradition of lamentation, which we have at home. And that idea of using the voice to dispel, to come to terms with grief in the body. This is something that has always fascinated me, not just as a musicological academic exercise, but as somebody who's deeply felt it and experienced it. So I'm not talking about here about something I don't know anything about. I do. I've experienced it. And I'm back there when I sing these songs. I'm back there with those women. I feel I'm right there, back there with the composers of that song, going right through that grief, holding their hands. We have a phrase when we ask somebody to sing a song. We say, cuss our on them, which is turn a song. And it means you hold hands, or at least in tradition. We've lost it now. You held hands to the person next to you and you turned the song with them and they turned it with you and they were as much part of that song as you were. I still feel that same connectedness with songs from my tradition, the deep women's songs of my tradition. When we were young, in school, and still sadly happens today, we used to learn this next song, Peter Petter. Feel, feel, run, oh, feel, run, oh, it's my handy one. Not knowing at all the meaning, the depth, the expression that lay behind this outburst of 
grief. And the story behind Phil Phil Arunol, which is true, it's a true story, is a woman lived in Donegal, Benny Ronel, Mrs O'Donnell, around 1745. And she had two sons, both of whom became Roman Catholic priests. And this was huge for her because it meant a standing in the community. She must have done something right, rearing them to have two priests in the family. And much later in 18th century Ireland, but maybe even still there, there were three pillars of respectability for an Irish family to have. And one was to have a pump for water in the yard, a bull in the field and a son in the priesthood. So this woman, one of her sons has now decided that he wants to become a Protestant minister. And so this woman, Benny Ronald, Mrs O'Donnell, cannot accept that he is now going to be happier because he can marry the woman that he loves and that he's going to be wealthier because apparently Protestant clergymen were wealthier than their Roman Catholic counterparts in 18th century Ireland. But through this song, this wonderful, deep, inspired song, where she's lamenting her son leaving her, it's a lament that she utters to this man. By the way, this man is buried in Carrigart in County Donegal, in a lonely little graveyard there, Minster O'Donnell. And so this woman utters this outcry to him. How dare you? How dare you hurt me so much? Return, return, my son. Think of me. I'm an old woman. I've never had such a hurt in my life as you leaving me, you leaving the priesthood. On Sunday you said mass. On Monday you were a minister. My curse on you women because you've taken my son away from me. What will I do when I go to mass on Sunday? All the young girls will point to me and say, there goes the mother of the minister. And then finally she reiterates a cry to him to come back, return, return my son, come back to me, to your congregations, to Mary. It's a powerful piece of creativity in that it starts on the highest note possible of the song. And after three short little phrases, the grief ceases. The thundering waves become still. And then she starts again. And it's one of the powerful examples of the healing power of music, of the healing power of the song. I want you to meet another woman consumed with desire and grief now. A woman who lived much the same time as that older woman, Benny Ronel. But this is a young girl who was given all her love, her existence, her life, her reality to a young lad called Donal, Donal Daniel, Donal Og. And this is a sound which is, versions are found all over um, Ireland and Scots Gaelic too in Scotland as well and it's a very very beautiful song of grief and of desire it's a prayer and she says oh Daniel young Donal if you go away if you go across the water will you take me with you Donal I'd be good for you I'd be as good for you as a noble lady 
proud and haughty. I'd milk the cow and I'd turn the churn for you. And, you know, if things were difficult, I'd strike a blow for you. My heart is black as a slow inside me, or as black shoes on lime-white holes, or as black coals in the forge of a smith, and a black cloud of sorrow overhangs my laughter. Because you've taken east from me, and you've taken west from me. You've taken my future, you've taken my past from me. You've taken the sun, you've taken the moon from me. And my greatest fear is, Donal, my greatest fear is that you've taken my God from me. From the where is from to hear him? From to roam a is from to my may. From to an galloch is from to an green him. Ach, is river matis. Another song of a young girl, but with a very different outcome, that having gone through the grief of rejection and dismissal and hurt, disappointment, she has now come to terms with this grief in her life and this huge nobility, independence, self-sufficiency, speaks through as she says in the chorus, go and leave me if you wish to, never let me cross your mind. And if you think I proved unworthy, go and leave me, I don't mind. I learnt this song from two sisters, the Keen sisters from Carlistran in County Galway. And I love to sing this song because it conveys to me that sense of nobility of that girl, that sense of independence that sense of aloneness in the very best sense. from the Irish tradition of women's songs. I've just given you a little glimpse, a little tiny photograph of three of these creators, three of these composers. So it seems logical now, friends, to go back to the very first women's voice that we have from my tradition, which is a voice that spans back 1,200 years to a woman who was a mythological figure. She's a woman who, legend has it, was lover to seven kings of Ireland, she it was who fashioned much of our landscape in Ireland and she lived at the southernmost tip of Ireland in a little place called Bear Island. She's known as the Calach Vera and we have some wonderful earthy, bitter words of hers which are very much a lament, a lament for her youth, a lament for sensuality and now that she's nearing the face of God. She is now in the winter of her carnal life and she's passing that in a convent. But all the time her youthful memories are dancing in and out of the stark realisation of meeting God, a stark realisation of death. And I have found her words particularly powerful any time I say them, any time I encounter them, and indeed any time I present them to other people, any time I share them with other people. I can still feel her in this room now as I'm about to prepare you for her words. Ireland, of course, is... A very small space, small but very special. The best of goods come in small parcels. The best of places are small. It doesn't have to be big, expensive areas to be special. And so Ireland is very special, I think, because of, well, for me, because it's surrounded by the sea. And that connection is there all the time. If you put your hands out, either to the right or to the left, or to the front or to the back, you can nearly touch the sea in Ireland. 
We're only an hour's drive, wherever you are, from the sea and from that power. It makes us, I think, what we are and certainly makes this woman's words what we are. She has been touched by the sea. The sea rolls through her, rolls through her words all the time. The sea crawls from the shore, leaving there the despicable weed, a corpse's hair. In me, the desolate withdrawing sea. The old woman of Bear, the old Calach am I, who once was beautiful. Now, all I know is how to die. And I'll do it well. Look at my skin stretched tight on the bone, where kings have pressed their lips. The pain. The pain. I don't hate the men who swore the truth was in their lies. One thing alone I hate. Women's eyes. The young sun gives its youth to everyone, touching everything with gold. In me, the cold. The cold. Yet still a seed burns there. Women love only money now. But when I loved, I loved young men, young men whose horses galloped on many an open plain beating lightning from the ground. I loved such men. And still the sea roars and plunges into me, shoving, rolling through my head images of the drifting dead. A soldier cries pitifully about his plight. A king fades into the shivering night. Does not every season prove that the acorn hits the ground? Have I not known enough of love to know it's lost as soon as found? I drank my fill of wine with kings, their eyes fixed on my hair. Now among the stinking hags, I chew the cud of prayer. Time was the sea brought kings as slaves to me. Now I near the face of God and the crab crawls through my blood. I loved the wine that thrilled me to my fingertips. Now the mean wind stitches salt into my lips. The coward sea slouches away from me. Fear, fear brings back the tide that made me stretch at the side of him who'd briefly take me for his bride. The sea grows smaller, smaller now. Further, further it goes leaving me here where the foam dries on the deserted land, dry as my shrunken thighs, as the tongue that presses my lips, as the veins that break through my hands. Images, friends, as relevant, as potent, as important, as moving, as they were to that woman. <laughs>